Welcome to the Do No Harm Podcast, where we discuss the battle to keep politics out of medicine. With our host, Dr. Marilyn Singleton, and Do No Harm's founder, Dr. Stanley Goldfarb. Together, we're talking with people to create a better healthcare system for all, one that's based on medicine, not division. Welcome to a very special show. While others on campuses of higher education shouted each other over identity politics, Professor Yasha Monk has been quietly and thoroughly studying it. He's a scholar in the truest sense, a professor at Johns Hopkins University, author of five books that are published in over 10 languages, and the founder of the digital magazine Persuasion. He's also a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and host of the Good Fight podcast. Dr. Monk's newest book, The Identity Trap, A Story of Ideas and Power in Our Time, is an examination of the new ideology he calls identity synthesis and how it undermines free society by manufacturing a zero-sum competition between identity groups in everything from education to medicine. Dr. Monk has spoken at the United Nations, the World Bank, the United States Congress, the House of Commons, the European Union, among many others. And today, we are so privileged to have him speaking with us. Welcome to the show, Professor Monk. Thank you so much. Well, Dr. Goldfarb, why don't you start us off? Well, thank you. And and really, it is a a pleasure to have you here with us today. So um, your book uh, is a wonderful book. And I I urge all of the people who listen to this podcast to to read it, to understand a very different perspective on these culture wars that we're having. And and, and particularly, I I found one of the really valuable things in your book, um, The Identity Trap, is your... um, your review of the origins of identity politics, particularly starting uh, times after World War II and and a little bit later. So I thought it'd be a good way for us to start for you to, if you can, give us a brief summary of those. I know it's a a huge topic with many, many important uh, individuals who have contributed to to some of these ideas, as, as, as destructive as we feel that they are. But nonetheless, I think it's important that we understand their origin. Yeah, thank you very much for, for for having me on the show and and for this question. Um, you know, when I started to write about this new ideology that has conquered big parts of the left and is increasingly influential in the mainstream as well, I thought, well, um, you know, before I analyze it and explain my critique of it, I need to actually understand where these ideas come from. And so I looked for good literature on the origins of these ideas and was surprised by how little there is surprised by the fact that virtually no academic had actually written seriously about the intellectual origin of this new ideology. The few things that have been written tend to claim that this is a form of cultural Marxism, so that the way to understand this is to go back to good old-fashioned economic Marxism, to take out uh, you know, economic categories like class uh, or the relations of production and put in identity categories like race and gender and sexual orientation. And that basically gives you the new ideology. And that never made sense to me because it doesn't actually explain many of the otherwise surprising commitments of this new ideology. And because um, that's not the kind of thinkers that activists today refer to. They don't talk that much about Marx or Engels or Gramsci. They talk about a very different set of theorists. And so I set out to trace my own intellectual history of this movement. And it starts, I think, in post-war France with Michel Foucault, with his deep skepticism about the existence of universal truths, his skepticism, therefore, that neutral rules or laws uh, could be a good guide for society. It goes on to the post-colonial thinkers who were deeply inspired by Foucault, but who also were concerned about the ways in which he did not... Uh, believe in identity categories and the way in which the implications of his work didn't seem to be uh, all that political because he thought that each set of discourses would be as oppressive as the other. And so they set out to repoliticize postmodernist thinking. They did that 
by putting the critique of political discourses into the service of specific political ends by saying a key way of doing politics is to fight over the representation of different ideas and groups in society, as Edward Said claimed. And then by embracing the concept of strategic essentialism by saying that even though perhaps philosophically speaking, talking about groups in very broad and abstract terms is overly essentializing, has downsides for strategic political purposes, we should uh, double down on those kind of group identities. And that helps to explain a lot of pedagogical practices today when teachers, for example, split young children up into different groups based on their race to uh, have them engage in those kind of affinity group exercises. Um, so that is, I think, the deeper origin of these theories. And many of those ideas were then applied to the question of race by the founders of so-called critical race theory, like Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw. And, and, and that really stands at the origin of uh, many of our cultural debates today. So I think one of the points you make in the book is um, talking a bit more about the particular issue of uh, the Black community and uh, the philosophical basis for this idea of, uh, and, and the, the issues and problems associated with it, this idea that race is a social construct as opposed to a uh, an actual biologically based activity. And, you know, our, our, our organization is focused mostly about racial issues associated with medicine. Could you elaborate a little bit of, on that? As, as, a, as I recall, you seeing this is something of a, and even the founders of it, seeing something of a, a, a difficult concept that holding two ideas that really weren't consistent with each other in mind about race as a social construct. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this really uh, goes back to this debate between uh, Foucault and then uh, an Indian history theorist called Gadri Spivak. Um, so Foucault, in our terminology, is gay, right? He's homosexual. But he didn't like those terms because he thought that they were overly essentializing, overly constraining, but actually the variety of sexual experiences people have is much broader than the sort of simplistic categories of homosexual or heterosexual. And this inspired a broader uh, skepticism towards the usefulness of speaking uh, in terms of groups and on behalf of groups. In one uh, uh, dialogue with another French philosopher, Foucault says that, you know, the old Marxist was wanted to speak on behalf of the proletariat, right? Um, they thought themselves as a vanguard of the proletariat. We should give that up, right? The workers can speak for themselves. And Gaiatou Spivak reading this said, well, look, that might be true for white workers in Paris who went to school, who know they're going to have dinner on the table at night, um, it's not true for what she calls the subaltern, the, the, the poorest, uh, most oppressed people around the world. And somebody really needs to speak for them. So even for these kind of essentialist concerns about group identities are right, for these strategic political purposes, we really need to double down on them. And she coined this term of strategic essentialism, which she acknowledged was self-contradictory. She said, my search is not one for coherence. But she thought that's the right political strategy. And that's really at the base of how we've inscribed race into the center of many contemporary debates. So, you know, if you recognize that race is broadly speaking a social construct, which I think that's a little bit simplified, but broadly speaking, I agree with that, right? There's two kinds of upshots you can take from that, right? One is the one that Karen and Barbara Fields took from that, two important African-American theorists, who wrote in Racecraft that we should be very careful about racial talk, that even seemingly uh, benign uses of racial categories and so on, recommit ourselves to racialist thinking, um, and that the right response to the recognition that race is in key respects a social construct is to use race less as a social category. That is not the school of thought that has won out. In fact, it is the school of thought that critical race theorists most angrily, most adamantly reject. So instead, you now see uh, many activists saying, race is a social construct. This is the kind of lip service they pay, right? And then they go on to say, we have to listen to BIPOC people. We have to delegate our decisions to people of color, right? They, they, they immediately after stating that race is a social construct, go on to use very broad, essentializing categories of race in a very unreflected way. And interestingly, Spivak herself came to fear this. She said that, you know, the concept of strategic essentialism uh, ended up being the union ticket for a vulgar form of essentialism because people 
basically drop the strategic element out of the out of the equation. Yeah, you know, in, in medicine particularly we found this to be a real issue because there are, in fact, biological uh, issues related to race, mostly because a large percentage of the African-American population comes from a particular geographic origin, a geographic location, and therefore they they share certain gene uh, variants that, you know, evolution has, has forced on a, a population that exists in this particular geographic area. So there are clinical problems that are related to their uh, geographical origin in West Africa, for example, kidney disease, which is to a great extent driven by a particular gene variant that the vast majority of African Americans have. At the same time, we're told that these these clinical conditions are due to social issues and social problems. So this incoherence is something that uh, you know we've uh, we've encountered and and i think it holds back uh, you know a real effective ways of dealing with these issues when one blames it on you know th- these social ideas when in fact there's biological basis for it you you can attack the social ideas all you want but you're not going to get at the biological problem that underlies it so so there's certain specific ways in which race clearly Nazi Jewish women are much more likely to have a certain kind of genetic variance that makes them prone to breast cancer. Um, so, so, so clearly there are certain ethnic groups that are prone to particular diseases. You know, Coleman Hughes, um, a young writer who has an interesting book out, uh, I think has a nice analogy for how to think about race, which is to say that, you know, the, the day of week, uh, about 24 hours, um, that is pretty much a biological uh, or, or physical given, right? I mean, it just takes about 24 hours for the earth to uh, uh, revolve. And, you know, basically every culture is going to come up with something like the measurement of a day. A week is much more arbitrary. There's nothing in nature in particular that takes seven days, right? So that is just a social construct that humans in one particular culture have made up to be useful and other cultures might have come up with six day weeks or five day weeks or not have had weeks at all, right? A month is somewhere in between, right? The reason why we have a month has something to do with moon cycles, but those aren't exactly 30 days or 31 days. They're not 28 days in February and 31 days in January, right? So here we're in a realm where the particular ways we split up the months is quite arbitrary, um, but we are responding to something real out in the physical world, but the month is broadly tracking. And Corbin Hughes argues, I think quite convincingly, that race is in that kind of category, right? That there are clearly phenotypical differences between uh, people from East Asia and people from South Asia and people from North America and people from Sub-Saharan Africa and people from Western Europe and so on, right? Uh, that there may in certain specific circumstances be ethnic groups that have genetic differences that are relevant in a medical context, like Ashkenazi Jewish women when it comes to breast cancer, cancer or African Americans when it comes to sickle cell disease, right? But that the lines we draw between those two groups are often quite arbitrary and that we should always be on the lookout for those, right? And so one example of this is the American one drop rule, right? If you're saying, well, one drop makes you African American, Given American history, I see where that comes from, but that may not be very useful in classifying patients because a patient that is 116 for African American is probably not more likely to have sickle cell disease the way that a patient that has exclusively African American ancestry does. So there our category is too simplistic. And of course, I worry about this particularly when it comes to public policy, right? So when you say, you know, people of color are at higher risk of COVID, which was true for the first parts of it pandemic, but probably not for the second parts of the pandemic. Uh, and when you say, you know, therefore, we need to prioritize Asian Americans in medical care. But actually, Asian Americans throughout the pandemic had lower rates of mortality due to COVID. You're just using a super simplistic racial categories like, you know, people of color to make decisions that I think are wrong in terms of purely medical grounds and are very polarizing in in a political way. Marilyn, I've sort of... Uh dominated this unfortunately Perhaps no have, no just have, listening question about l- listening to this it's reminding me when you talk about we can talk about the political origins of identity politics and i think back to the 60s of trying to get racial pride the black is beautiful movement 
which was fine. So people didn't feel like they were the underdogs. And then suddenly the language now, and we're hearing it in medical school, sounds just like the segregationists of the 50s saying people learn better if they're with their own kind and this sort of thing. How do we get beyond that where, you know, on one hand, there's this fluidity of the concept of race and it's telling us, okay, you know, race matters, but in some ways, but not others. And then suddenly they want to throw people of color into groups where they can only talk to each other and it seems wrong how do how do we work our way out of that mm. yeah and this is really one of the remarkable things both about this political moment you know so there's, there's critical race theory um and it's been uh, you know i think that the people who um uh, made up this tradition Derek bell and kimberly crenshaw and others are interesting um scholars who who had some interesting points to make and and i take them seriously as thinkers uh you know they've been sort of unfairly caricatured and maligned on parts of the right that uh don't take these ideas seriously at all but on the other hand that uh, those attacks have then led the defenders of this theory to caricature it just as badly in pretending to defend it um, because they basically say, well, crit critical race theory, that's just wanting to think critically about the role that race plays in our society and what could be wrong with that. Well, of course, we should think critically about the role that race plays in our society. And of course, there's an injustice that we need to remedy. But when you look back at where these ideas come from, it's very clear that critical race theory goes much further than that. And in fact, Derek Bell, uh, really the key figure in the tradition, makes his name by attacking the civil rights movement. Right. So he in the 60s works for the NAACP, helping to integrate schools and businesses in the American South. But he comes to think of that work as in many ways being a mistake. And he starts arguing that perhaps Brown versus Board of Education wasn't the right way to go, that civil rights lawyers were too obsessed with integration um, and that they should have tried to improve the education of black pupils. Um, irrespective of whether or not the schools are integrated, but perhaps schools that are separate but truly equal would have been preferable. And so that segregationist instinct is there from the beginning. Now, that's always been there in the black political tradition, right? But, but what's striking is that it was always a minoritarian uh, view within it, right? There was uh, Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King on the one side and Malcolm X on the other side of the debate. And over the last years, mostly... Uh, because of how decision makers in society who tend to be white rather than black have elevated these ideas and implemented these ideas. For the first time in American history, we've turned that separatist black nationalist tradition into the mainstream voice of black America, even as you know, opinion polls indicate that that is not at all what the average African-American today believes. And that is the kind of strangeness of this political moment. And how do we fight back against that? By pointing out that the assumptions of this tradition are wrong. They claim that we've not made any progress on race relations, just as uh, certain uh, LGBT rights activists claim that we haven't made any progress on the treatment of sexual minorities in this country. And they say, if we haven't made any progress, then it's time to throw all of our principles overboard and make how we treat people explicitly depend on the group categories to which they belong. All of state policy should not ask, you know, are you a member of this political community and, you know, what kind of attributes do you have to qualify for medical care or whatever? They should ask, which ethnic group are you a part of? Which sexual minority groups are you a part of? And depending on that, we're going to treat you differently. As, um, of course, the, the CDC and others suggested we do during the pandemic in terms of who should get COVID vaccines, right? And so, uh, you know, the way to fight against this is to say, well, we have made progress, but our country is imperfect, but injustices of a genuine nature remain. Sorry, there's, I believe there's an earthquake. It's an earthquake, yeah. Yeah, we're feeling it. Are you it feeling it as well? well? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> Your uh, ideas have created an earthquake. Yeah, there you are. God is punishing me for... Uh, no, your words are so profound. That's what it is. <laughs> no, no, no. Wow. All right. Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's over now. Yes. <laughs> Um, that's, that's, <laughs> that's wonderful. First. I've never, I've never had that before while recording. Uh, where were we? Okay, so yeah, the way to answer this 
is to point out that uh, we have actually made genuine progress. But even for genuine, you know, the, the status of African Americans in a hundred or fifty years ago, and the people who deny this might claim or pretend to be, you know, acting in the in the name of political justice or social justice or something like that. But it's actually deeply offensive. Not offensive to the great Americans living today, but offensive to the people who suffered much worse forms of discrimination. Uh, you know, in 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 the past, and and therefore, what we need to do to keep improving is to double down on these improvements. Is to uh, show that actually integration is working. It's not fully implemented yet, but it is working. That trying to live up to a universal principle is making society a more just and fair place, and so on. Let me just uh, switch because we're almost uh, out of time here. But to the issue of uh, that, that's been very of great interest to our people that are part of our organization and that is the issue of the anti-semitism that's arisen over the last uh, several uh, months after the October 7th it's it's sort of reared its ugly head at that at that point and its relationship to the issues we've just been talking about specifically what's been questioned is whether the the so-called DEI movement ought to be extended to Jewish students, or in fact, the way to, to solve some of these problems is to get rid of that approach to racial harmony and, and group harmony uh, by eliminating DEI. Do you, do you, can you sort of comment upon that that issue and, and your view of that? Yeah, so I think I have a pretty robust view of free speech. I think that part of living in a deeply diverse society and part of living in a free society where we don't get the government the right to decide what we can say and what we can hear is to tolerate very, very unpleasant forms of speech. And there certainly has been many of those on campus over the course of the last uh, six months. I think that is the price of pay, living in a, in, a, in, a, in a free society. The problem is that those rules have been over the last six or ten years, right? Where uh, on the one side, if you engage in any kind of microaggression against a group that is treated as being somehow protect it or politically then you have a campus bureaucracy that immediately uh, uh, investigates you for your misconduct but if you uh, engage in micro or mac macro aggressions against Jewish students on campus then nothing much really happens against you uh, you know if you uh, break the rules of conduct that always have to go along with norms of free speech on campus in one direction you're suspended or thrown out if you break it in the other direction and you occupy lecture halls and common spaces and so on the bureaucracy is too afraid to punish you and i think it is that deep hypocrisy that unfairness that has rightly uh, enraged people and cost universities the moral authority now the question is how do you you know whenever you have a tension whenever you have a hypocrisy um there's always the question of how do you resolve it right um do you resolve it by treating you know all groups in accordance with that set of special rights and privileges we've started according to people or do you solve it by returning to the underlying principles that actually treat everybody the same right it's it's, it's a parallel debate once we we're leading earlier and when african americans we really are discriminated against in society in certain ways do we turn the whole of society into a place where how we treat people depends on the group you're from and we sort of negotiate and bargain over who gets what when? Or do we say, no, let's remedy those forms of injustice and discrimination so that everybody's actually treated as an equal? And I would say, uh, as somebody who is Jewish, that Jews would make a very big mistake normatively and strategically if they decide that the right cause of action is to demand the same special rights and privileges for themselves that other minority groups have had over the last 10 years. It's a mistake strategically, because even if the institution promises to grant you this, whether or not it actually does will always depend on the whim of administrators, right? It'll always depend on whether you happen to be in favor of your authorities, whether when you're being attacked, you know, verbally, a student is going to be punished, whether, uh, you know, when, 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 when you say something that others in the campus community don't like, you're going to be protected. And I don't think that recent trends indicate that making ourselves dependent on the whim of administrators is uh, the right course of action. And I think it's wrong normatively because it is universal principles like robust norms of free speech and the rules that go according with those uh, norms that have actually allowed our society to flourish, that have allowed us to sustain a deeply diverse 
uh, country that is affluent, prosperous, dynamic, and for the most part manages to get people to live together in peace across you know, ethnic, religious, sexual, and other differences. And it's not a coincidence that those are the kind of societies in which Jews have flourished. So for both those uh, strategic reasons and much deeper normative reasons, I strongly believe that we shouldn't say we should also get the same special treatment. We should say get, get rid of special treatment and treat everybody the same in accordance with the longstanding rules and values of our society. Well, that's great. You know, as uh, I always love one of Winston Churchill's famous saying is that the American people will do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And maybe that's where we'll end up with this. Well, I just personally, uh, as well as looking at the larger picture, we have to get away from categorizing people as victims. And I think and I, Jewish people have certainly been victims of many, many bad things pre-biblically, but they cast themselves more as survivors. And as a Black person, I would like to look at myself as not a victim, but a winner and somebody who's overcome things. And that's how we have to have people look at themselves and not foster this victimhood. Well, yeah, you know, Edward Said, who's one of the figures I cover in the book, and who I have robust disagreements with about all kinds of things, said very nicely that um, you know, the point is not victimhood. The point is not to revel in victimhood. The point is to overcome victims in victimhood. The point is to create a society where there's fewer victims and so fewer people are encouraged to see themselves as victims. And he meant that very much as a criticism of a kind of incipient forms of identity politics on American campuses. You know, I grew up Jewish in Germany. And, you know, I often encountered people who uh, treated me as a victim, who wanted to demonstrate to me how sorry they were for the German past and, um, you know, how much they loved the Jews and so on. And that always came from very good intentions. And, and I appreciate, you know, that they were grappling seriously with, 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 with the history of the Holocaust and were somehow trying to make me feel at ease. They did the opposite, right? They succeeded in doing the opposite because those forms of slightly creepy philo-Semitism did not help me feel as an equal. They did not make it easier for me to have uh, genuine friendship with uh, people who acted like that. They, mm -hmm. they, they erected an invisible barrier between us where we could never truly see each other as humans, never truly see each other as classmates or as friends or whatever the social context was. And so I think sort of victimhood is a political trap because it encourages a form of zero-sum conflict between different groups um, that is not going to lead to a better society. It's also a, a personal trap. Um, and it's a personal trap that is dangerous if you self-oppose it. It's also dangerous when others impose it on you, which is something you might not necessarily have that much agency over. Thank you, Dr. Goldfarb. We'll give you one last question here. No, I think this has been really just wonderful. And I, I'm, instead of asking you a question, I'm going to, again, urge our listeners to get your book, The Identity Trap. Explain why it's a trap. You've, you've sort of uh, pointed out some of the issues in the, in the last few minutes here. But um, I think it's a it's a very important book. I think it helps explain, particularly from someone like yourself, who you've, you've self-characterized as a person of the left and, and have really uh, talked about what we like to think of as classical liberal sort of values, the ones that Coleman uses, has talked about. And that really is the model for our organization. That's what we'd like to see in, in healthcare. And I think it's it's just a, a very valuable addition. And I, I, again, I urge our, our listeners to, to get that book and read it carefully. So thank you so much for coming on today. And I know Marilyn will have the last word here. Well, I just say we need more voices like you. And thank you so much for your book. And I'm sure you'll write more on the topic and we can't wait to read about it. Thank you again. Thank you very I'd, much. I'd like to thank everyone for listening and thank you for supporting our efforts to protect patients, physicians, and healthcare itself from divisive audiology. Please visit us at donoharmmedicine.org. And thanks again for listening. Mm -hmm.